Well, hello. Good afternoon to uh, our listeners and friends who are in the lower 48, and good morning to our friends way out there in the Hawaiian Islands. We always appreciate you all tuning in as well. You're listening to best practices and risk considerations relating to summer camps on campus. Uh, a presentation being brought to you today by the law firm of Thompson Coburn LLP as part of our higher education webinar series. And it's been a little while uh, since we've uh, been with you all. I'm, I'm sure like many of you on campus can appreciate it has been a very, very busy uh, late summer and fall and start to the semester. Uh, before we get started, just want to go through a handful of housekeeping items, as we always do. Um, first of all, if you have questions during uh, the webcast, you can submit them through that Q&A widget that you see at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we encourage you to do so. We always appreciate questions. We, we like to answer your questions if we can. And we also think that that interaction um, makes for a better webinar. We will try to answer all uh, that we can during the webcast. But if a full answer is needed or we run out of time, uh, we'll try to get to you later on by email. Uh, a copy of today's slide deck is available in the resource widget, and we encourage you to download any resources or other links that you may find useful. Um, you can also find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. Um, this webinar, like all of our TCLE webinars, uh, is brought to you if you're an attorney type out there in part uh, to satisfy your continuing legal education requirements. This CLE in particular is accredited in California and Illinois for an hour and a half of general CLE credit, and in Missouri, as always, for just a little extra, 1.8 hours of general CLE. Um, the webinar is also accredited in New York for an hour and a half. Uh, of, quote, experienced and transition credit, and 1.5 hours of general CLE credit in Texas is pending. So uh, we are working in more and more states as we try to uh, make it easier and easier for you to get your CLE in. Uh, keep in mind, we award CLE based on attendance for the entire 90 minutes. And uh, as you go through this presentation, you'll see some secret words pop up. Those are back because we are now getting approved for CLE in more states. Uh, so we encourage you to keep an eye out for those. I think there are three that will pop up during the presentation and uh, you just need to interact with us a little bit to confirm your continued attendance. Um, finally, uh, I, as always, I will ask you to keep a lookout for the post-webinar survey. Uh, we deeply appreciate uh, when folks take the time to fill out those surveys. We truly do read them every single time and we really do take all your feedback seriously and, and try to make the next webinar always better than the one before. I mentioned earlier this is being brought to you by the law firm of Thompson Coburn. Uh, we're one of those biggish law firms with several hundred attorneys around the country and lots of places that you've heard of, and every once in a while one or two that maybe you have not. Uh, we have higher education practice at this law firm, which means we have a number of individuals who either work uh, full-time with colleges and universities or a significant amount of their time goes into working with you all. Um, today, and here's a group by the way, a pic picture of the lovely faces of many of the people in, in the higher ed practice. Um, I'm moderating our session. That's, uh, I probably don't even deserve that much because most of it's going to be handled by your presenter, but I am the chair of the practice. My name is Aaron Lacey, uh, and I'm a regulatory guy and do lots of different things for institutions, including big uh, transactional substantive changes, things like that, um, all, all kinds of issues, and have worked in the space and with institutions for about 20 years and I'm grateful for the opportunity to do it. Your presenter today is my colleague, Scott Goldschmidt. Scott was the Deputy General Counsel at Catholic University in Washington, D.C. for uh, about eight or nine years, nearly a decade, uh, and joined us a couple of years ago, the, the week the national pandemic was declared, an auspicious beginning, has been working out of his basement for months and months, uh, but brings to the table uh, real meaningful experience in a lot of areas, but particularly around these summer camps. Uh, I know he's done presentations with NACUA and other associations in the past, um, and so we're really pleased that today he's going to be able to take some time uh, to tell you what he knows. I know a lot of institutions, you all are more and more engaged in offering these types of camps and similar types of events on campus, trying to make use of that space, particularly in the summer months. And there's a lot to, to keep in mind. So Scott, uh, with that, I will advance the slide here to our syllabus and turn it over to you. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you, Aaron. Uh, it's sure a pleasure to, to be here and to speak on this topic. Um, it is one that's near and dear to my heart, one of my favorite kind of topics of all the ones that we deal with uh, in our higher education practice and kind of in my, in my practice prior to, to Thompson Coburn. So as Aaron said, I worked 
a Catholic for almost a decade uh, and did got the chance to work in a number of summer camps with administrators um, that came to this idea with the best intention. So they wanted to do something great, something cool, something innovative, and they all had a great idea. A lot of times they just didn't have a great appreciation for a lot of the risks, a lot of the, the details, a lot of the operational kind of hurdles to, to camps. Um, so hopefully what we'll be able to do here is just talk about um, some of those risks, some of those operational details to consider, whether you're just starting a camp, thinking about starting a camp, or whether your institution has had a camps run for, for a number of years. Um, so we're going to cover a lot. I sure promise all is manageable, um, and the idea here is just to kind of get out in front of it, consider everything deliberately, and kind of come to reasoned conclusions for how best to kind of run your summer camp. Um, we thought November is a perfect month to, to do this, not because institutions are holding camps anytime soon, but because it'll give institutions a chance to, uh, to, to, to gear up, whether you're just kind of newly coming to the camp space, um, whether you're starting recruitment, or whether you're having, about to have your first camp with a new COVID environment. And I know that's the, the challenges of COVID and camps are on everyone's mind, uh, and we'll be detailing a lot of those potential issues and, and maybe things to think about as you're uh, considering what has changed in the past, um, past little bit. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to talk about uh, four main topics. So first, for those that are just thinking about uh, summer camp, uh, a couple considerations of, of kind of how to go about it, the main types of summer camps, um, and, and kind of what goes into the, the thinking process. Uh, your best practices and considerations before camp. So as you'll notice, uh, that section is by far the longest section of the presentation. That's by design. That's why we're doing this here in November, to make sure that uh, that all these considerations and, and things can be uh, have, have adequate time to, to kind of permeate uh, what happens during a camp and what happens after a camp. And then at the end, Aaron's going to go through a little bit of extra credit and other things uh, that we deal with in the practice. All right. So thinking about starting a camp. So camps typically arise in institutions in one of two ways. Uh, first, there's an institution-sponsored camp, and also there's a third-party sponsored camp using the institution's facilities. Um, so the difference between uh, those two um, is, is pretty self-explanatory. So the institution-sponsored camp, so say we're at Blue Jay College, uh, it's the Blue Jay College baseball camp, the Blue Jay College engineering camp. So this is where the institution takes on all the, the responsibility, they take on all the, the, um, the, the, the wherewithal. It's really the institution there that, that runs the camp. Uh, the second one we're talking about is a third-party sponsored camp. So this is uh, Coach Mike's basketball camp that happens to take place at Blue Jay College. So it uses the institutional facilities, um, but it really kind of is a third-party organization, a third party that, that deals with this camp and the institution's really there just to kind of uh, to have facilities, have food, uh, and, and not really run the operations. There's pluses and minuses to both, which we'll get into in a second. Uh, important to note that many institutions host, host both camps. So a lot of institutions will have a number of institution-sponsored camps, and a lot will have a number of third-party camps during the summer. So thinking about starting a summer camp, there's a number of reasons that can go into it, or a number of considerations, some reasons why you would want to start a camp. Um, so first one important to note is mission. So colleges and universities, their, their goal, their idea is to, to craft young minds. Usually those minds are 18 to 22 years old, but it certainly makes sense to include uh, uh, younger kids, high school kids, even, even grade school uh, kids as well in that camp that goes to the, the kind of overall mission of a camp and of an institution and camps certainly add a lot to that. Uh, community outreach, um, as, as, as many of you have worked with camps before, uh, institutions before, um, community relations sometimes are challenging between the institution and the, the community at large. This is a good opportunity to, uh, to, to engage some some kids in the community to, to get some goodwill, to, to kind of let them come on campus and, and use some resources. 
Um, revenue is important, right? Uh, some camps, as we'll talk about, really don't make a lot of money. Others, you can charge a, a significant amount, especially for overnight camps. Revenue is an important um, generator for camps, not just to sustain the camps themselves, but to potentially go back to the university general funds and just become another revenue source uh, for those institutions. Uh, recruitment of potential students maybe is one of the more, most important kind of reasons to start a camp. Um, obviously, there's a number of different channels institutions have, uh, marketing, communications, going out to high schools, those kind of things. But if you really kind of have a program that you're proud of, targeted in, whether it's your math program, your engineering program, your baseball team, there's really nothing better than having a student kind of come onto campus and, and, and kind of experience that, 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 that educational program, that athletic ability, those engineering facilities, that baseball field kind of for themselves. And to the extent that the institution can show that student uh, a good time, that they have resources, smart faculty, great facilities, great food, all the reason that the student might want to come to come to that institution when they're uh, looking to to make that four-year commitment. Uh, retention of employees uh, is certainly uh, an important aspect. Um, a number of institutions, uh, especially for assistant coaches, might not be able to pay significant salaries um, during the academic year. But if there is a camp opportunity at the institution where the the coach can kind of recoup some of that salary to to kind of make up for, for maybe some of the lesser uh, pay during the year. That's certainly an important consideration. Uh, and publicity, right? So the more the universities out there, the more, uh, the more uh, exposure, the more students, the more goodwill, all those good things. Uh, but as we'll talk about for a lot of the rest of the presentation, uh, risks and exposures certainly follow um, most things that institutions do, but certainly those with minors. So going back to so the first tranche, the institution-sponsored camp, when the college and the university sponsors and controls the camp, it's another aspect of that institution's programming. So a lot of great things for that. So as we talked about, it supports the mission of the university. The institution gets to keep all this revenue that it's potentially generating from this camp. Uh, you can institute appropriate controls. And what we're talking about here are, are, are policies, procedures, things that you as your institution took years to develop and hone and those kind of things and, and you, you're not seeding them to another party, you can make sure that the, the, the appropriate kind of policies, controls are in place because you're kind of in charge of the camp. Um, name publicity, recognition, um, all those kind of good things where the more you hear the engineering, the Blue Jay College engineering camp, the Blue Jay College math camp, um, just good things for, for your marketing, for your uh, engagement and kind of retention of students. Um, and you can control the programming. So you're sure everything that goes into this is, is kind of as you, as you want, as you expect, and, and, and there is, uh, there's just that, that, that level of control that can give you comfort. Um, but uh, as we said, there's a bit of downsides too about these institutionally sponsored camps. So, so the first one to consider is the administrative burden. And so this is kind of when I started the conversation about people coming in with the best intentions, not really understanding kind of what uh, goes into a camp. Um, if your institution is sponsoring a camp, there's a lot of offices that are going to have to be involved um, from HR, uh, your grounds, your athletics, your public safety, your dining, your finance, your council. You're creating this additional program at the institution and, and you're going to have to kind of support it with staff and, and that creates some burden. Um, so the opportunity to shift risk, we'll talk about um, when we, we kind of discuss these forms. But one of, the, one of the benefits to having a third party camp is you can, by contract, shift away a lot of liability to the third party, the LLC hosting the contract. Here, there's less opportunity to do that. You could do a little bit through, through forms with individual students and parents, which we'll talk about, but a lot of the liability still likely remains in the institution. You have to put in place these policies and controls. So it's great that you can put them in, but a lot of institutions don't have policies, don't have practices geared specifically to minors. So to the extent that you're going to uh, create this camp uh, environment, then you'll certainly have to make sure that you have these policies in place uh, to, to support these students. 
Uh, negative publicity is, 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 a, is an important consideration. So just as things can go very right and people can kind of rave about the great time they had at the Blue Jay College theater camp, if something goes wrong, if there's injuries, if the food's bad, if, uh, God forbid, there's a really kind of significant incident, there, there's possibly uh, for negative publicity, and those uh, would be attributed to the camp as well. And it costs a lot to create and maintain these camps. Uh, on the flip side, when you're at a third-party sponsored camp, a lot of the inverse is there, right? So the university does receive some revenue by contract, so it's not all the revenue. The, the camp's going to make the profit, but just by kind of your, your rental fee or your classroom fee or your food fee, there will be some revenue. Um, another benefit is you can shift that risk minus, obviously, these, these, these provisions are, are all dependent on state law, but for the most part, aside from things like gross negligence or intentional misconduct, you can shift a lot of risk to the third-party camp. Uh, that administrative burden is smaller and there's lower costs because the camp is charged with running the, the programming, charged with running the, the operations. So really, uh, your responsibility is, is significantly less at the institution. Uh, you still have that outside exposure to campus, campuses and facilities. So even though it's Coach Mike's basketball camp, it's Coach Mike's basketball camp at Blue Jay College. And so there is a significant uh, benefit to students kind of coming onto your campus and, and kind of seeing, well, Blue Jay College has some great basketball facilities. So maybe that's a, a plus. Um, and you learn your publicity. You, you don't take on all the risk of kind of having the, the great or the, the horrible camp. Um, but on the flip side, uh, these downsides and risks, so you're, you're seeding, uh, you're shifting a lot of the risk, but you're ceding a lot of the control over the camp, the staff, and the campers. Um, your liability can never be eliminated, certainly because by contract you, you can't do that, um, but also there's just different things that, that could come up um, where uh, you still might kind of come back to the institution. Um, that all those controls that you put in place, those hundreds of policies that your institution has, um, you might be able to, to impose a few of them or certain ones, certain ones on these institutions, but for the most part, the, the controls and the day-to-day the -day operations are at the third-party camps. So you're kind of at their, their discretion. Um, again, you have limited control of the program and you're not the one developing the, the curriculum, the courses, the activities. And so, uh, so that's kind of a, a thing out of your control. And, and there is still negative publicity, right? So if, if the, the counselor at Coach Mike's basketball camp does something terrible or something bad happens to a student, uh, the, the, the college university is still going to end up in the paper, still going to be a, uh, a, a focal point. It's going to explain that it happened at this camp. And the distinction that it was Coach Mike and Coach Mike's staff running the, the camp might be lost on, on the, the quick reader. Uh, and minors on campus specifically, um, we're going to touch on this subject a number of times during the presentation, um, but for you're here, just to keep in mind, institutions that haven't run camps previously may not be set up or equipped to have a significant number of minors on campus. There's a big difference between having eight-year-olds kind of running around uh, the, the, the football field or the cross field and, and kind of having 18, 20-year-olds on campus. There's different legal duties. There's different requirements, there's different expectations. So to the extent that an institution hasn't considered just being set up for this, it's, it's something that you should really kind of think through before accepting, uh, especially younger age kids on your campus. Um, and it requires different, different laws. So we all know higher ed is an immensely regulated uh, industry, and there are a number of regulations you'd have to add to it that deal with minors, uh, federal and state laws, those duties and responsibilities, um, policies and procedures. Again, we'll talk about a little later protection of minors, uh, and related to background checks, um, and, and specific risks that might be specific to minors that are greater than, than your average student. So with that introduction, we've hit our first uh, secret password. Um, so I've been instructed that I need to leave uh, the, the the screen up there for at least 30 seconds, so I'm going to do that. But today's first secret password is tree. Please select the correct secret word from the session below.
the selections. Scott, while folks are Excuse doing me. Scott Scott, while folks are doing that, you keep referring to Blue Jay College. I'm not aware of a Blue Jay College. Um, I am aware of several institutions that have the Blue Jay as a mascot. And so my question to you, while we let the last 20 seconds click down, is if you can name any institution. I have at least seven in front of me. Any institution that uses the Blue Jay as a mascot. Without Googling, you can't Google. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, no, I'm not Googling. But, I, you know, I, 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 <laughs> I was trying to think of a, a name that, that was not used. Um, so, so nothing is – It's a, nothing it's a common mascot. It's the pressure. One of I'm them thinking the Toronto is, Blue Jays, but uh, yeah, yeah, no, but one of them's close to you. It's John Hopkins University, right down the street from me, right? And Creighton University. Yes. <laughs> I've got Elmhurst, Tabor College, or Tabor. My apologies to anyone who might be from Tabor or Tabor. Elizabethtown College, and also the Polytechnic Institute of New York University. So a lot of people. Creighton. It's Billy Blue Jay. It's their mascot. So um, well, just shame keep on in mind when you not knowing that. well, I'm just saying if you're going to throw around these types of things, if you're going to start inventing, uh, what's that? I think the U.S. Department of Education always uses North South University. That's their their <laughs> fake university for a lot of their things, which I always get a kick out of. Um, I think that's 30 seconds. So uh, maybe hopefully everybody Good. click the radio button and we can get back to business. All right, thank you. Yeah, and I learned something too. So this is this is great. Some. Information about camps and information about uh, about about college mascots. So this is great. Um, so let's get into considerations uh, of institutions prior uh, to, to starting a camp. So again, this is going to be the, the biggest section by design. Uh, there's a uh, a number of um, uh, just considerations that institutions should need to have kind of as they're going into this process. And the first, I think, is who at your institution is responsible for approving a particular camp. Make sure they know what information a decision maker needs to see. So again, it, it's, it's, it's kind of having the cool idea, uh, the innovative camp is, is one thing, but for the most part, decision makers at, at these camps are gonna really wanna know schedules, business plans, revenue projections, kind of what institutional supports are required um, and, and kind of information to, uh, to make sure that they could make a, an honest assessment about whether the institution kind of wants to, to, to go in and, and kind of uh, follow through with this camp. Um, it is important, and I think uh, for those of you that kind of have been through this process before, institutional buy-in uh, is, is, is very important to this process. So all the departments that I mentioned before that Kind of have some stake in the camp environment. Um, kind of all need to, to to be aware that camps are part of their job responsibilities. So if you have some great medical facilities on campus that service your students, but your contract with your medical providers only says that you can service uh, college students 18 to to 24, wherever the age group is, then that doesn't really help you for, for, for the camp process. You're going to have to go outside. You're going to have to figure it out. Um, it's a lot of wear and tear on your public safety, your grounds, and those kind of things. So making sure that your institution really kind of understands why you're doing this and, and supports you is, is exceptionally important. Uh, two different ways to, to kind of structure these things at camps. Uh, a lot of this probably depends on the resources of the institution. So a lot of schools... Uh, that big state schools with symphony funds might have um, summer camp offices. They might have protection of minors coordinators, individuals that uh, that kind of do this for a living. Uh, in there, there's there's usually a centralized office, <clears throat> individual charges overseeing all camps uh, in in this approach. But for for schools that might not have uh, a spare person or people to kind of run a summer camp. Um, a decentralized approach might make sense. So each camp being responsible for its own operations. And then the, the trick is just making sure that there's some approval, there's some consistency in policy, there's some understanding of, of who, uh, who oversees what and kind of where decisions have to, have to occur. Insurance, uh, another potentially big issue to make sure that institutions kind of are, are appropriately covered for, for this kind of camp. So a lot of university, a lot of college insurances 
we'll cover most uh, aspects of the of the institution, um, particularly including summer camps. But it's certainly important to check before starting a camp, before accepting uh, certain age students. Make sure that you're you're covered for all the the really kind of important. Uh, buckets, the property, the liability, workers' comp, health insurance, all those, all these kind of things when you're not dealing with uh, students or an aspect that's not part of your core business. So if your core business, right, is the education of college students, making sure that, that these operations covered is, is an important consideration kind of before you even get started. Uh, another important piece, um, sexual misconduct molestation insurance. Uh, usually is not included in this general kind of bucket list of, of insurance. So especially when dealing with minors and really honestly when dealing with institutions in general, making sure that you have this sexual molestation insurance coverage, this rider uh, in addition to your policies is, is important. Um, and business interruption, again, this, 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 this bullet was not included uh, in the versions of the presentation prior to COVID, but as we'll talk about, um, it is it has become a very important uh, hot topic, uh, much litigated in the COVID environment, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but important to kind of have that insurance coverage as well. Uh, staffing, right? So issues that arise with minors could be innumerable, but one of the most important kind of things to, 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 to to consider is, is kind of who is directly interacting with minors and kind of making sure that as the institution that's sponsoring, that's employing these counselors, volunteers, vendors, et cetera, that you've done your due diligence and there's an appropriate kind of level of, um, of oversight, engagement, all those things to make sure you're getting the right applicants, the right people kind of interacting with minors. Um, so, so screening applicants for positions that involve access, one of the most important ways to mitigate risk. Um, state law kind of has screening requirements, but prudentially, even if, even if state law does not kind of uh, speak on this issue, it's important for your institution to, to make sure that you've done your due diligence um, with regard to these, these counselors. Uh, here, one of the important potential supports that institutions have is your HR department and, and kind of in the business of doing this screening and the business of doing these interviews, maybe not for minors, maybe the criteria changes a little bit. Uh, maybe the increased screening levels kind of accord with the, the risk of having younger kids on campus, um, but certainly professionals there, there can help you. Important to know if your HR is bought in, is willing to support this endeavor, or if the HR department uh, focuses on on kind of the the the, the other the the college age students of the university and those kind of things and will not give you that support. Uh, so the American Camp Association standards are required. So I'm going to mention the American Camp Association a few times. Uh, it's a phenomenal resource for individuals. Uh, Thinking about summer camps uh, has a lot of best practices. They're not in the university context, but they are kind of just general smart things that people that deal with camps for a living have kind of set. A lot of checklists, a lot of great information freely available. Uh, here specifically, I'm mentioning the standards in, in terms of what's required for, um, for staffing, uh, a criminal background check, at least two references, and a personal interview kind of for all individuals that come onto campus is a good standard kind of set by a group that deals a lot with uh, institutions, uh, or I'm sorry, with, with camps and, and screening and uh, employment of younger, uh, of people for younger individuals. So regarding background checks, um, the first stop uh, that should be on anyone's list is state law requirements. So to the extent that state law speaks to uh, checks with, um, with certain age kids, uh, the required aspects that need to be in that background check that obviously should be on your radar and, and must be followed. Um, if there's no state law requirements, then kind of following these best practices in terms of uh, what other institutions do, what the American Camp Association recommends is, is really important here. Um, an important consideration is whether you're going to require a background check for individuals that 
deal with the camp in general employed by the camp or only those that interact with minors. That's an important kind of debatable topic and, and people kind of come to different conclusions on, on that issue. Um, at minimum, so if you're not requiring a background check for everyone involved, so for example, if you hire the, the cook in the kitchen that's not dealing, that will not, will not deal with minors at all, you decide that there's no background check required. Uh, the DOJ sex offender check, that link there, is a free resource and, and certainly can, you could kind of plug in someone's name. Easy way to make sure that someone's just not on a big red flag list. Um, different states have different laws in terms of applications. Again, this might be something that HR can help with. Uh, things like ban the box, which prohibits uh, putting a, uh, employment, um, uh, asking certain questions your employment application, uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act, whether they apply to these this camp environment, uh, all kind of different state law questions that um, that you should consider kind of as you're uh, screening, as you're having people apply to these camps. Um, how often employees need to get checked um, is an important consideration as well. Usually there's a certain number of years that must go by uh, before you have to go through another background check. So again, following best practices, state law, your institution's procedures is really important here. Um, and considering what answers um, or, uh, or, or kind of things you get back from a background check is disqualifying before you get that is really important. So there might be some hits that you potentially get as part of a background check that uh, you would never want to put that person in front of a, a camp, a student, or a minor, or anywhere near it. Other issues that kind of could potentially be flagged that might take some thought and uh, the, the point here is just to maybe consider some of those issues prior to actually getting a, a disqualifying result back or a negative result back uh, to make sure that you've, uh, you've appropriately thought through that, that concern. Uh, interviews and reference checks, um, again, all the, the HR uh, pieces are important, but when you're dealing with students that might be 19, 20, 21 years old, uh, a background check kind of from 18 to 20 might not be the most valuable piece of information. Um, th people like the DOJ have, have certified that, that these uh, reference checks might be the best, most useful kind of piece of guidance when dealing with uh, students. And, and the great thing is you have a, 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 a great uh, resource in all your professors deans, administrators that have dealt with students, they might be able to give you the most valuable information kind of when dealing with uh, interviews and reference checks. Um, and again, the goal here is just to ensure that your selection of the, the, the individual is, is, is competent and that they do a good job and they can perform the work, but also that they can interact well with minors. And that's, again, where a lot of the big risk is, and that always should be um, uh, in the back of your head as you're doing uh, these checks. Employment and payroll considerations. Um, again, this, this is a good place for HR, for counsel to be involved uh, in terms of how you classify your, your individuals. Um, and so it's really important that you appropriately categorize your counselors and staff as either employees, independent contractors, or volunteers. There's very specific kind of legal guidance that goes into these considerations and making sure that you appropriately uh, kind of have justification for, for each one of those is, is important. Um, it gets a little tricky too when you're hiring uh, a full-time faculty member or a full-time staff member or a student kind of for a, a, a similar role or, a, or a, very, a dissimilar role, excuse me, at the camp, just making sure that you, um, you kind of have that in mind uh, going forward. Um, your payroll processes, so to the extent that you have a, 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 your full-time tenure-track math teacher, they'll, they'll get the same check, assuming uh, nothing is, is different kind of that they will through the normal process. But getting a student kind of through the background check process, getting their employment information could be a headache, so making sure that you kind of have that information available, that they could satisfy the legal requirements for the institution and, and kind of in the law, and that you have it done well enough in advance to, to make sure that they can kind of get their paycheck on time is all important. And stipends, too, uh, are, a, I know, a very popular way to pay uh, or uh, people at camps making sure that's done appropriately and legally is another question. So making sure if you're using stipends, consider it 
uh, kind of go that extra step, uh, especially if you're kind of using overnight housing as, as a potential means of payment, all very important to, um, to, to do, to consider, uh, and just making sure you have those uh, <clears throat> aspects appropriately in place. So I previewed this a little bit earlier, right? So when we're dealing with minors, there's, there's, there's different ways to interact, there's, there's different requirements, different laws, and, and different policies. Uh, and the first that I'll discuss is the protection of minors policy. And so this is one that, that most institutions have, I think those that have summer camps and those that don't, um, but just a general policy to establish guidelines and procedures to protect minors and to provide guidance um, for how to interact with minors. And so a lot of the, a lot of the prescriptions of the policy are um, common sense. Uh, a lot of them kind of just reiterate institutional aspirations for kind of how they want to deal with and treat minors. But certainly an important tool, an important aspect of, of an institution's kind of playbook as you're, uh, as, as you're kind of thinking of increasing the amount of minors you have on campus, making sure that there's a, um, a, a university set guidelines, rules, expectations for, for when they're uh, present on campus is, is very important. Uh, training as well. So I think there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of good trainings that your institution gives to faculty and staff, generally safety, security, kind of all those kind of fun things. When dealing with camps, when dealing with minors, adding specific training for protection of minors is kind of critically important, not only to educate and make sure that everyone kind of understands the gravity and severity of dealing with minors on campus, but also just to make sure from a, a legal protection standpoint that if something happens, you have a good clear record that you had a policy, you gave all this training, you, you made sure that your, um, your faculty and your staff had a good understanding of what, uh, what was permitted, what was not permitted. Um, appropriate interactions with minors, things like not, no, no going into a, a restroom with them alone, no gifts, no interaction with social media, all these kind of things, again, maybe common sense, but always important to, to reiterate. Understanding mandatory reporting obligations. So if you are a coach or a faculty member or a counselor, there may be legal requirements for you to report child, child abuse, child harassment, or, or suspected abuse or harassment to the, the authorities, to the child protection services. So to the extent that that exists, very important to make sure that that you train your individuals that they have this obligation. Obviously, you'd want to make sure that they also report that to the institution, but there's a legal a potential legal obligation to provide that to the state. Spotting signs of abuse or harassment. So again, if, if there's harassment between individuals or uh, staff and, and, and a student or students, those kind of things, just to make sure that someone has uh, given, given some information on signs, things to be aware of where to report it, what the appropriate expectations and obligations of the institution are, and, and rules regarding social media posts. So you, we'll talk about forms and taking photos and those kind of things, but personal kind of posting of, of minors' information on a, um, on, a, on a social media site is maybe not the, the best idea. Uh, so talking about ways to, to kind of shift, allocate risk, uh, when you're the institution, you're, you're, you're kind of taking it all on yourself. It's an institutional program. You'll likely be named in any lawsuit or issue that, that comes up. But there are a couple ways that you can kind of, through forms, shift a little bit of the risk or at least kind of strengthen your legal position um, if something were to occur. So these are a couple clauses that, that are important, usually typical in um, institutions' agreements uh, with minors, um, when doing a summer camp. So the first is an assumption of risk clause. Uh, it's a potential defense to claims of negligence. Basically says that I specifically uh, understood that this might occur uh, and I'm voluntarily doing this activity. Um, 
the, the general advice here, make clauses as specific as possible, identify known hazards. It's less effective to say generally you might suffer injuries, mental issues, loss of property, than to say for a chemistry camp you could suffer burns or beaker explosions or whatever the, the, the particular uh, issues are with the camp. So be specific in these clauses. Um, also, we'll talk about two COVID specific languages might be important as well. Um, so that's the assumption of risk language. Um, the hold harmless and indemnification clauses, these usually are kind of put together in one kind of legally scary paragraph. Uh, these are very, all these clauses, but these two in particular are very dependent on state law. Um, so this is one of the areas where certainly getting advice of counsel uh, is, is important to make sure that you specifically don't carve out or, uh, or, or cover too many things that would make the enforcement of this uh, not, not applicable kind of if ever brought to a judge or jury. But a hold harmless provision relieves one party of blame or liability for damages. Basically, I agree not to hold the university harmless for X, Y, Z that occurred. And indemnity is kind of a, a, an allocation of risk. So by contract, you would, you would assume the risk, assume the debt, assume the liability of uh, certain claims or losses that the institution has for the specified um, activities kind of in that contracts clause. More forms and agreements, and, and right, if you've, if you've ever dealt with camps or sent kids to camps, there's, there's a lot. So, um, so this should not be new, but medical acknowledgement and consent, um, certifying that the camper with or without reasonable accommodation can safely participate in the camp is important. Uh, more important here, consent for medical treatment and care in the event of an injury. So to the extent that uh, a, a catastrophic injury happens, an individual needs surgery, uh, and it's not, you have to take them to the hospital right then, there's not enough time to, to kind of get a parent to, to come down, you want to make sure that you have the ability to, to kind of authorize those treatments in the event of an emergency that a parent has kind of provided that uh, in case there is an issue. A photography and video release. So um, I, can't, I, don't, I can't imagine why a school would not want to kind of have this to be able to post pictures, but you would want your, your, your camper, their guardian to sign off on this release prior to publicizing the camp, showing how what a great time you had and all those kind of things on social media and Facebook and all those, those fun things too. Um, and, and cancellation, right? So you wanna, you wanna make sure that in your forms and agreements, you're specifically enumerating when the camp can be canceled, what are the circumstances, where your refund policies are, what you'll be charged, what you won't be charged, all those kind of fun things are important to, to spell out uh, just because you, um, you want to make sure that you, uh, um, uh, if there is an issue, right, that, it, that it's clear and everyone's agreed up front. So right, so again, enforceability, the, the way these, these, these clauses are crafted is highly dependent on state law. Again, this is, this is a good chance for, for, for counsel to be involved. Um, if the individual is under 18, which we would assume is the vast majority of people kind of coming to a, a, an institution summer camp, uh, make sure that the parent or guardian signs as well. Their signature is really the more important one. Um, to the extent that you want to have the camper acknowledge as well, things like assumption of risk, that's, there's no issue with that, but you really need to get that camper or guardian to, to sign off. Um, and uh, an issue we've, we've dealt with a lot recently is electronic signatures. So making sure to understand and abide by those state laws and regulations. If you're asking for electronic signatures, nothing wrong with kind of the old pen and paper and scanning back um, but uh, we understand that's an administrative hassle. There's nothing wrong with using electronic signatures, but there are very specific kind of laws and kind of guidance that, that, that are required and just making sure that you, you follow that is, is very important. Uh, payment issues, right, important to consider. Um, so, so again, you, you, you need to, uh, to, to get paid in order to, to keep the camp running, to keep the institution happy. Uh, think about, are you accepting cash, check, credit? Um, if you're accepting credit cards, making sure your institution uh, is compliant with 
PCI GSS standards, which, um, which I assume the institution is, but making sure that you can get on the institution's kind of platform to, to be able to take advantage of those uh, processes, right? Um, and, and revenue, uh, this is important as well, just to consider uh, before you kind of get all this great funding and who, who gets to keep the revenue. So is the camp revenue there for the university's general fund? Is the camp's revenue kind of for the camp to use? Or is there some kind of hybrid where the camp will uh, kind of pay the institution a, a cut to, to compensate it for all the staff time that it's, it's been used, but for the most part will, uh, will come back to the institution. So we talked about protection of minors training, other trainings that are important to have, general trainings I think that would be any kind of, uh, any, any employee uh, policy right, general rules and expectations of the camp, emergency protocols and emergency contact information, what happens in the event of injuries or illness, and, and missing camper protocols, right? So there's a very important consideration, uh, what do you do there? Uh, and compliance, again, uh, with all trainings, needs to be tracked, needs to be monitored. Vendors, again, so we talked about the importance of due diligence and making sure that you get appropriate staffing for individuals who are going to be kind of with minors, caring for minors in front of them, kind of on your staff. Uh, important to do it also with vendors, right? So to the extent that you're having vendors there for a demonstration or to be interact or those kind of things to make sure that that there's there's no reason that they shouldn't be around a minor. That's also very important. Uh, safety with transportation, a big issue with camps and colleges, just making sure that there's an appropriate track record and safety and that you've kind of done that due diligence check. Um, and to the extent that you think appropriate to include certain limitations or uh, or, or terms to, to kind of bind individuals, putting those in the contract and making sure that you, um, you, uh, you have them signed. Uh, I think the last slide, again, for institutionally sponsored camps, drop off and pick up, again, another kind of big issue. Uh, how do you get individuals onto your camps? How do you get them off? So this policy, I guess depends on your age of your campers. I think there's there's reasonable discretion for a, between a policy for seven year olds and a policy for seventeen year olds. Um, but generally, if, especially if you have these younger kids, having that designated area for pickup, thinking about a photo ID, thinking about having that that staff member greet that camper, and having approved individuals being permitted to pick them up, all important things. Um, and additional forms, releases, etc might be required if you permit the camper to, 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 to leave, to walk home, to take public transportation without a, uh, without a parent to pick them up. Again, not necessarily prohibited, but just to make sure that it's acknowledged that when the bell rings at the end of the, the camp day, that you're free to kind of let, leave them and let them walk home without, um, without having someone pick them up. I was right. All right. And that brings us to our second secret password. Thanks for everyone hanging in so far. Uh, today's second secret password is music. And please correct, please select the correct secret word from the selections below. And we'll leave this up for 30 seconds. So Scott, I was thinking, I was actually thinking back earlier this summer, I remember you had just gotten back from Harry Potter camp and I was just back from Lord of the Rings camp, and we were talking about how there are so many great camps out there for kids and adults. And, uh, and we were talking about how so many of those camps are really unusual or interesting these days. I mean, compared to, in all seriousness, you know, 30 years ago, there's just this extraordinary proliferation of uh, topics that kids can go learn about and, and sort of immerse themselves in over the summer. And so my invitation to the folks listening, if you've already filled in your radio button and you're waiting, uh, tell us what camp you have on your campus that you think is particularly unique or interesting, or if you know one that's across town. Uh, but let's see if we can get – I'm very interested in, in what folks uh, have to report in the way of the most interesting or sort of unique camps that they've seen or that they may host. Uh, we, we won't attribute them to any particular campus, so don't worry. We won't call them out. But uh, if you've got a, you know, surfing camp or, uh, or Dune, the movie camp or something like that on your campus, uh, put it in the Q&A. Let us know. And when we get to the end, I'll, while, while Scott is giving you meaningful 
details. Uh, uh, I will go through the Q&A and, uh, and call out, see if we've got any interesting entries. But, but uh, truly, if you've got something sort of unique or interesting or special on your campus, uh, throw it in the Q&A box because we're very interested. You know, that's what we're talking about today and curious as to what's, what's out there. By the way, Harry Potter Camp and Lord of the Rings <laughs> Camp are both real. And uh, and uh, they are just for children, so probably not for the folks on the line. But if if you have a young one that you think would like to attend, you can look those up. And I think that's about thirty seconds. <laughs> that's right. And you know, I, I I used to joke about the, the the math camps and the engineering camps, but those those are the most popular ones. The really conscientious students that uh, that really just want to learn advanced math over the over the summer and, and do some really cool things and. Hey, more power to them. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm very interested as well. If anyone has some good uh, some, some some good thoughts there. Um, so so moving on to uh, to third party camps. Um, so we talked a ton about if you are the the institution kind of holding the camp and you have a lot of the the, the risks, the liabilities, the the controls, those those requirements that go into it. A little less onerous on the third party side. Um, so again, when you're approving camps, just consider who's the decision maker, who needs to see the, the camps, what the appropriate structure is, what do you have to get in front of that person? Um, in addition to the business terms, right? So a lot of the, the camp is gonna be uh, financial. Uh, you're, just, you're providing a, a service, a facility, classrooms, et cetera. Um, prudential reputational issues are really important before approving third party camps because you kind of are ceding a lot of that control to this organization. You're hoping they abide by the contract in these terms, but uh, there's a chance that they won't, right? So certain camps can be controversial, could have controversial speakers. You just may not want to deal with that. Uh, certain camps might have wear and tear in the facilities. Uh, another, an interesting camp, I don't know if this exists, Aaron, but the, the Dirt Bike Association of America wants to use your football field for their, their camp. Uh, I think regardless of what they pay you, you're not going to want to kind of have them tear up your football field. It might not be worth the, the hassle. Um, but also a benefit, right, on campus. Even if you're not making money off of it, the engineering camp for high school students showcasing your facilities, your expert faculty, or your expert kind of labs, really, uh, might be worth it, even if you're not making money, to, to make sure that you have uh, the right individuals um, on the campus there. Uh, so the agreement with third-party camps is really important. That's the main way institutions can kind of make sure that these third-party camps are, are kind of following the right uh, the, the, the right the right rules. Um, it covers the relationship between the the institution and the camp. Your a, a, a big goal is typically trying to transfer as much risk and as much liability to that third party organization. That's one of the main draws, the main benefits of that third party camp, making sure that your agreement, your language kind of appropriately reflects that as important. Uh, important when you're designing your, your camp and advertisements and things to think through in your contract, making sure there's no confusion between parents and campers that they're, that they're sending the, their student to um, the, the Blue Jay College camp, the Harry Potter World experience versus Harry Potter World at Blue Jay College. So thinking through kind of what you want to prescribe in terms of identification, use of logos, mascots, trademarks, et cetera, is, is a really important kind of goal there. And then just to know, again, we talked about before, regardless of how much risk is transferred, fill your campus you can't kind of get everything away. There is a risk to having third parties on your campus in general. Um, in this agreement, you really want to describe with specificity what the arrangement is. And again, when, we're, when lawyers are given contracts, it's not because they were given, uh, it's because there's an issue, because there was a concern, the dispute. Um, so the general sense to, to kind of avoid having to send your contract to a lawyer is to make sure you're specific, include the specific facilities that are to be used, don't kind of say the general athletic complex if it's only at the football field. Specify the purpose, so they're only permitted to, to kind of have football camp, not have a football camp and fireworks show or whatever the, the, the thing they might want to do after that. Uh, and include the dates and times when the use is permitted. So if your use ends at 5 p.m., don't just put a day, put the, the time so that you can come in and get your cleanup crew ready to kind of have the camp or the, the space ready for the next day. Uh, ensuring the third-party camp is obligated to take good care of the, the facilities, 
not allow waste, not allow nuisance, all very important to kind of have in that contract in case there is an issue. Property damage, again, very important when you have that dirt bike of America camp on your, on your football field tearing up your property. Uh, who's responsible for property damage? Um, wear and tear, general wear and tear is usually excluded, but to the extent that it's above that, making sure that it's the third party that's responsible, that it includes replacement costs in addition to kind of patching and fixing, and that it's the institution that goes out and gets to decide kind of how to appropriately repair their baseball field because you don't want the, the third party and their kind of bootleg crew coming out and messing up your, uh, your, your, your beautiful field. That's an important resource for your campus. Um, a hold harmless and indemnification clause, again, if permitted, appropriate by state law, very kind of uh, important to consider having this in the contract, uh, standard term, uh, and making sure you want to get that as strong as you can uh, to, to, to kind of protect your institution. Uh, and including insurance, and this is, this is a standard clause, right? You want to have appropriate amounts of insurance coverage, usually one to one million per occurrence, three million in the aggregate, kind of some figures in those amounts. You want to make sure the, that the, the policy includes the required coverages, right? Not just general liability and property, but sexual molestation as well. Um, but also want to make sure the quality of the coverage. So to the extent that you've ever seen some insurance certificates from uh, people that don't really know what they're doing, there's a lot of websites that kind of you could put in, I want one day event insurance and you pay them a hundred bucks and they give you a million dollars of coverage, those I would find it very hard to, to kind of recover uh, anything like that. So you want to make sure that the, the quality of coverage is there so that if you do have an issue, if you do have to draw on that insurance, it's a reputable company. Uh, again, more to include in the contract, it's fee, the deposit requirements, security deposits, refund policies, um, all important to kind of spell out. Um, responsibilities of camps and participants, right? So who has responsibility for supervising, making sure that it's not the institution, you want to stay as, as far away from kind of supervising minors as possible. You don't have that control. It's all in the camp. It's, they're required to have these background checks. They're required to, to get appropriate consents from minors. They're required to kind of do the general supervision, make sure these ratios are, are all applicable. Um, and, and security as well. So depending on the nature of the camp, obviously this doesn't apply to every circumstance, but um, a security plan might be appropriate if it's if it's kind of a, a high profile camp uh, to kind of have uh, crowd control or things like that and make sure that only the right people kind of come onto their campus. Um, but also all important discretion to remove anyone from campus. You don't want to cede the the, the, the control over um, over your dirt, over your your policies. You're you're renting a facility. You're not kind of giving them carte blanche for anything. So you want to make sure that discretion is retained. Everyone agrees that. If, in your reasonable discretion, you think that there's a uh, there's a reason to remove someone, that you have the ability to remove them. Uh, compliance obligations uh, applicable. Obviously, we want to make sure that the institution is abiding by applicable laws. Um, likely, there's not a, a good idea to kind of have them certified. A, 300 institutional policies as some institutions have, but to the extent that there are certain important policies, important to name them specifically, give them copies, make sure that they really kind of understand that you're, you're, uh, this is part of the contract, that they have to comply with these policies. If there's guidelines for athletic events, include those too. Um, what has to be required in terms of safety and security and those kind of things. Uh, disclosures to the institution, background checks, those kind of things. What what has to be disclosed and when it has to be disclosed, right? Um, and, 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 and taxes and, and kind of UBIT and those kind of things that, uh, that are, are more institutional aspects and, and, and responsibilities, uh, but just important to kind of consider that, that those compliance issues are there as well. Uh, cancellation and force majeure, I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll briefly touch here and we'll talk about a little bit more in depth in the COVID-19 specific section. But cancellation by the institution or the third party for convenience or specific circumstances, where are the refunds going to be in these, um, in these institutions? All important to consider. 
making sure the institution has an appropriate plan for, for each one of these uh, activities, and then uh, make sure you put it in the contract in, in language that, um, that, that's easy to understand. Uh, and for force majeure as well, what specific circumstances would, would invoke that force majeure and then kind of who can invoke it as well is, is important to there. Special considerations at the third party camps run by an employee of the institution. So again, a lot of, a lot of times a uh, football coach, soccer coach decides that they're going to, to run a camp and as a courtesy, as a convenience, they, they want to run it at their, uh, on, their, on their dirt, on their field with their facilities and their coaches, but it's a third party there. So it's tricky because there has to be a clear line, a clear understanding of kind of a demarcation when that employee is working for the institution as the football coach, as the soccer coach, and when that employee is working for the camp. Um, and that's kind of easier said than done, but important to, to make sure that, uh, that, that they're not kind of using institution time to, to run their LLC business. Um, resist the temptation to allow the employee to use the administrative supports for the camp. So the employee's friends with the HR director and says, hey, can you help me run my background checks? Uh, probably not the best idea. You want to make sure that the, the control of the camp, the operations, uh, is with the LLC rather than the institution. And the more you kind of blend the two together, the, the harder it will be to, to kind of make a case that these are two kind of separate entities. Um, and take care when you're marketing. Camp. So the employee can be affiliated with the camp, uh, with the institution, but it's, it's really, it's Coach Mike's camp. It just happens to take place at Blue Jay College. COVID-19, right? So this is, this is all new things to consider as we're getting to the, uh, the, 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 the first kind of real summer where people can interact uh, kind of with COVID-19. Um, three important resources, I think, to, to, to keep in mind. Uh, first is the CDC guidance uh, for operating youth camps uh, and state law guidance as well is important to the extent that you're developing your, your COVID-19 policies, procedures, et cetera, staying close to those. That guidance is, is important and only kind of leads to your benefit if you can kind of point back to a, a government or state authority that either mandated or suggested this best practice. I would certainly uh, think that's a, that's a good kind of place to start at least. And again, the, the, the ACA, the American Camp Association, uh, all good things in terms of general uh, camp information, also have specific business resources related to, to, to COVID-19. Um, so I would certainly commend you to, to take a look at that as well. Um, understand that an institution's COVID-19 policies that everyone on your campus has spent months thinking through might apply to camps in many circumstances, but also may not. Remember, your, your COVID-19 institutional policies were developed for 18-year-olds, for 19-year-olds, for adults. Here, when we're talking about seven, eight-year-olds, uh, there might be different considerations and different guidance and state laws that, that could be in effect. So the vaccination of your staff and students and campers, your testing, the, the, the PPE, wearing masks and gloves, the social distancing and cleaning and health requirements, all kind of might be able to, to kind of crib from your institution policies, but think about them kind of with the lens that you're dealing with a much younger, much more vulnerable population, a population that may or may not be able to, to kind of have vaccines depending on kind of when you're having your camp, if you're having a winter camp or something like that. So all kind of important considerations to keep in mind. Um, state child care guidance might apply. So as I was doing my research for the presentation, reviewing some random states, the state of Connecticut has decided that their child care guidance applies to, to youth camps. Um, and as a, a father of a four-year-old and a two-year-old kind of in, in child care uh, in the state of Maryland here, it's no joke. The child care guidance is fairly onerous um, and, and certainly uh, I, am, I am confident it would go above the requirements that an institution has set for their kind of college uh, age students. Um, and also certainly important to make clear and communicate, it's all subject to change depending on the circumstances. Um, so things in COVID-19 that, that could be altered, 
uh, and again, this is this is kind of for the, your camp to to consider. Um, but but you might need to include more staff to account for increased leave. So people might need to take leave due to sickness. You might need more staff to cover. Uh, you might have to divide your groups of campers into smaller groups for activities. Uh, you might have to limit the number and size of your camp than you'd like to, uh, to ensure you have adequate social distancing as required by your institution policy or state law. You might want to consider more outdoor activities, so less kind of classroom activities there, but also reconsider the safety of certain popular potential activities that you had. So if you were going to a field trip or a restaurant, uh, or a baseball game um, that was crowded before, that might not be the best kind of activity kind of in COVID to, to continue. Uh, when you're doing your drop off and pick up, uh, maybe a staggered time frame to make sure that there, you don't have a list, a line of cars and students kind of coming in at the same time and you can kind of get them to the right uh, areas. Um, social distancing, uh, very important, right? For activity, age group, those kind of things, making sure that there's no um, uh, giant kind of groups of people. It's, it's just good policy and consideration as we're uh, in this new COVID-19 environment. Uh, when you're talking about overnight camps, um, maybe similar to your institutional policies, going to a one camper per room instead of bunk beds, uh, whether that increased your costs, something to consider. Uh, making sure that there's increased ventilation in the rooms and kind of the HVAC systems that you put in place to, to kind of make sure that you have good responses for parents that ask these questions. Um, when you're dining, kind of unfortunately, the, the, the big cafeteria, buffet style uh, uh, arrangements might not be feasible. Prepackaging these things in boxes, bags, not using kind of shared utensils uh, is potentially important. Uh, discouraging sharing of equipment and belongings, those kind of things uh, will help uh, save off interactions. Uh, staff leave policies, right, that are flexible, non-punitive, encourage the reporting of illness and COVID-19, making sure that if someone does report it, they're not ostracized and kind of putting put out there. Uh, potting groups, so that means just kind of not having the whole camp together, but having maybe uh, a group of 10, 15 individuals that kind of stay in one uh, area so that if there is a, a COVID-19 outbreak in one pod, you potentially don't have to close the whole camp and you can have the rest of the camp kind of set up there. Uh, and hand washing breaks and hand sanitizer stations um, as well uh, throughout the camp. Uh, again, this, this might be kind of where you can crib from your institutional policies, but that plan for COVID-19 exposure uh, importance um, so if there's a camper or staff member in close contact with a person positive for COVID, what do you do? Is there the requirement to get a, a come back with a negative test? Do they have to complete a quarantine requirement? To the extent that a quarantine requirement is 10 to 14 days, does that mean you have they can't come to the camp at all and all the refund policies that go along with it? Uh, just important to kind of consider because these are not hypothetical scenarios anymore, unfortunately. Uh, and, and when someone does have an active COVID-19 test, what's the, the, the plan, waiting for test results, are they allowed in camp, are they not allowed in camp, um, and kind of when you have that, uh, that non-COVID illness, right, that, that runny nose, the cough, the, 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 the sickness there, what's the policy? Is there a requirement to get a test, um, a doctor's note, or, uh, or, or something different? And last slide on COVID considerations. Um, so. If there is a COVID-19 exposure, making sure you follow your state law guidance, um, but also thinking through how to contact trace, clear, frequent communication to your campers and families, important. Uh, medical staff, uh, provider information, involvement is important. How to, how to notify the institution. Uh, and again, if your quarantine period goes beyond the length of the, the camp, um, is it possible to reschedule or give them a credit or let them kind of come back next year? So all brave new world with COVID, um, but important considerations for this year and hopefully this year as we go, uh, which brings us to our last secret word of the day. Uh, today's third secret password is blue. Uh, please select the correct secret word from the selections below. All right, all right, Scott. So I have three 
summer camps that I'm going to have gotten. These are all two. I, I can't tell if they're all which category they're in, whether they're actually uh, part of the university or whether they're uh, being held by an independent organization on the university's campus, which, if you, as you have articulated, is an important consideration. Um, but here they are. So the first one is Wizardry School. Uh, in this literary adventure <laughs> camp based on J.K. Rowling's best-selling children's novels, campers will be sorted into the houses of Gryffindor, Ravenclaw, Slytherin, and Hufflepuff. Throughout the week, campers will learn how to play Quidditch the this state university way and will vie for the coveted Quidditch Cup. On the last day of camp, friends and family are invited to cheer campers on during the Quidditch tournament and awards ceremony. So that is on the campus of a major state university. Uh, astronomy camp. Uh, uh, the other side of the country provides unique opportunities to explore the skies and the environment in general. Uh, each camp is an immersion experience combining all four STEM letters. We emphasize a hand-on learning approach with activities driven by student involvement. A prior background in astronomy is not required. Neither is a connection with this flagship state university that houses this particular camp. And then the last one, future filmmakers don't have to wait until college to hone their skills thanks to this exciting camp this week-long filmmaking intensive held at this university campus uh, in the state. Guides children through the filmmaking process with guides for everything from script writing to camera skills. Best of all, they get to craft a unique film of their own along the way. So just like we had back in the 70s and 80s, wizardry camp, astronomy camp, and uh, film future filmmaker camp. It's pretty cool. There's, like I said, there's a lot of, uh, for kids today, there are a lot of really extraordinary things. And all of those are on the campuses, in this case, it just so happens, of uh, large uh, public state universities. There you go. Awesome. And you missed, you missed your calling as a camp announcer. I am uh, I, sh I really would love, I know. Would love, well, would love to in, join uh, one, of those, one of those camps as well. <laughs> maybe in retirement. Maybe in uh, retirement. Maybe. Good. Well, with that, um, there was so much to talk about and everything before camp. I promise the last two sections are going to be a lot quicker. Um, but I uh, wanted to run through some best practices and considerations during camp. So again, we're talking about our institution-sponsored camp. Uh, one best practice that we could suggest is, is to have rules and regulations that are signed by both campers and guardians. So um, important things to potentially consider in your rules, behavioral requirements, free time, cell phone usage, dorm rules, prohibitions on things like weapons and drugs and rule violations and anything COVID-19 specific. Um, so again, a lot is self-explanatory, um, but important to kind of have that set out. You, these, these campers don't come in with a, a potential um, kind of uh, institutional handbooks unless you kind of prescribe it to them. So to the extent you need to take action to, to discipline or to kick someone out, important to have uh, a comprehensive set of rules that, that everyone's agreed to, uh, and, and everyone kind of understands the appropriate consequences from them. Uh, considering certain activities uh, when you're, you're in camp um, that might be popular, um, but might be more risky than others. So um, classroom instruction, clearly less risky than an offsite field trip. Kickball outside, less risky than, than free swim. And in COVID-19, we're potentially going out into a, a, a crowd or a public transportation could be risky as well. So kind of that risk analysis as you're considering institution-sponsored activities is important um, and being deliberate and understanding and, and flexible, especially I think for this 2022 camp year, which hopefully will be an aberration and kind of not a, not a, a consistent thing, more like a one-off, right? Um, so we talked about a lot of the applicable forms um, to kind of reduce risk and, and inform students. Uh, here we talked about the camp rules. Another important form to consider is a health information form um, so camps can prepare for accommodations and disabilities, be aware of things like allergies and medication. This is a very important tool if done correctly. So anytime you ask for sensitive health information, uh, it's, it's, there's, there's very specific requirements in the questions you could ask, how you have to secure the information, uh, and, and a lot of other kind of legal and prudential requirements. So it's important to have the form. The information is very valuable. It lets you plan. It lets you do all the, the kind of things you need to do to make sure that everyone has a, 
a safe environment, but also um, potentially a risky one. So make sure you take, take consideration to this one. Uh, take care to, um, to have that as well. Uh, camps need to consider how to address storage and administration of medication. This is a very important topic and will depend on the level of support, a lot of it, from, from your institution. Do you have access to your student health services to a nurse that can store medication? Um, if not, where will that medication be stored? Um, in will it be in the personal possession of, of campers? What will be in the personal possession of campers? Uh, and kind of how will you administer um, these, these important kind of, uh, these important medications and make sure they're not, not abused. Um, the age of the campers is probably important for setting your policies as well, but very important to consider uh, kind of how you're going to do with medication prior to getting into the camp. Um, some states require policies regarding medications. If your state requires a policy, have a policy. Um, to the extent your state does not have a policy, consider whether one's a good idea. Um, could, could be a good, uh, a good indication or way to think through a lot of these issues. Uh, disability accommodations, again, just like you are um, required to accommodate students in the classroom environment, uh, state disability law, the ADA, Section 504, may govern disability accommodations for a lot of kind of threadbare camps that are not familiar with disability forms and requirements and decisions. Uh, might be helpful to, to ask for a trained professional, the disability support office in your institution if they are available to you um, because this is a, it could be an important consideration. It is an important consideration, excuse me. Uh, tabletop exercises, uh, very uh, important for common situations that occur during camp, especially if you have young counselors to make sure that they're, they're not kind of in these situations for the first time, uh, trying to make decisions on the fly to the extent that you can anticipate some, uh, some common camp situations or maybe not so common. Uh, all the better for your camp and to make sure that you're appropriately caring for and treating um, for minors. So things like, what if a camper goes missing? What if a child needs emergency treatments? Kind of where do you go? What do you do? Uh, what's the emergency plan? Who's in charge? Who's, who's the, who needs to be called? Um, the camper violates a rule of conduct. What do you, what do you do? Uh, Camper has an EpiPen that goes into anaphylaxis from bee sting. Um, how do you make sure that you're able to, to care for the, the camper? Uh, your, your counselor has been giving gifts to campers or posting on social media. All these kind of things that, that could come up. Uh, always good to kind of take some time to think through how you would, um, how you would address it before it turns into a, a larger situation. Third-party camps during the camps, a lot, a lot less to do, right? So you're, you're kind of off the hook. You signed your contract. You have all the policies in place. Um, very important to understand the level of oversight that, that you can have, what's, what's required, what's important, making sure that the football camp is actually playing football and not having a bonfire or whatever it is. But the day-to-day -day operations of the camp, that is uh, up to the, uh, the actual um, camp itself. Uh, making sure that the institution and third party uh, are aware of appropriate points of contact, uh, both in the contract, maybe to spell that out, who the, who the appropriate person is. But if there are issues, say, with the dining hall or, or the facility or the sprinklers went on or something like that, who to call so that uh, they, they get to the right place. Um, reviewing um, the, the rights of the institution under the, the contract, so making sure the camp's providing the services they said they would, making sure the institution kind of can, um, can, can appropriately enforce the contract if it has to. Uh, so understanding kind of what, what their rights are, what their rights are, and do they have the right under the security section to remove an individual from the campus. Uh, again, a couple scenarios to, to consider in the third party context, right? Um, Canceling the camp because of the emergency. Again, this gets to the cancellation, the force majeure sections. Uh, if hopefully not, but if there's a COVID flare-up in May of next year and you need to cancel the camp, kind of how do you do that? What rights do you have to do that? Uh, if you have a request from the camper for a disability accommodation, making sure that you understand what 
accommodations the institution would be required to provide and what the third party would be providing. Uh, what if there's an injury or lost camper, lost camper on the third party side? You don't have the direct oversight as you would if you were dealing with the, 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 the camp itself. But if there is that uh, kind of still happened on your property, it still affects you, how do you deal with that? Um, again, uh, damaged property, what are your rights under the contract? And uh, if there's a report of, of harassment that comes to the university, what do you do? What, what's, the, what's the obligations? What does your, what does your Title IX policy say about this? All things to consider. Legal issues, unfortunately, arise regardless of the, the type. I think there's, there's good, thoughtful consideration that institutions should do about when an institutionally run can't make sense, when a third party can't make sense, but um, best laid plans kind of sometimes don't turn out the way we would hope. So have a plan in place and try and follow scenarios. Uh, again, if there are legal issues, our, our advice always, <laughs> follow your policies, follow your process, make sure you're abiding by your agreements and contracts and have those forms in place. Contemporaneously document issues, have a good, create a good record for yourself if you are, uh, think an issue might arise and um, consult counsel if necessary. Always good to, on our end, to get calls prior to, uh, prior to the crash landings. We, we can kind of affect a change. Um, always good to get in on the, on the ground floor. After camp, so you've had a successful camp, you've, you've done everything right, you've signed your contracts, you have all your forms, uh, always kind of more things to, to do. Um, I think one of the best pieces of advice is if there's a problem or a near problem that, that arose, um, take that opportunity to, to kind of, to, to not let that problem occur again, use it as an opportunity to make a change and kind of work on, uh, work on kind of making your camp better and troubleshooting issues as you go. Um, making sure all your paperwork's in order. This never, there's always something that slips through the cracks, whether it's a background check or a form or an agreement, that kind of thing. So just making sure there's a good uh, policy and understanding with regard to um, your paperwork and making sure that that is all in order. Uh, rethinking um, all your policies and procedures. So after going through camp, uh, all these rules, administration, security training, can use a refresh, you can kind of do uh, some interesting um, things as well for, for, for that. Also, to the extent that you set a lot of COVID-19 specific policies for 2022 and we're past it in 2023, then you can consider taking off your mask mandates and PPE and social distancing requirements and all those things you might put in place. Uh, tabletop exercises we talked about, always interesting, good thought exercises. Um, risk assessments and audit. So to the extent that you want to get an outsider's opinion to, to kind of see how you're doing, never a bad idea to have another set of eyes. Um, record retention, again, important documents. Uh, obviously, if you have a, a legal claim or a potential legal claim asserted during the camp, you'll know to keep on to some, keep something. But you might not know about a, a, an issue. It might not come to your attention. Make sure you're keeping your forms for the applicable statute of limitations for those um, unanticipated claims. Confidential documents that you just don't want to have in your possession that has no that have no good for you. The, the health information forms, things like that. Think about whether it's appropriate to destroy them after the presentation. Uh, I'm sorry, the camp. Uh, and with that, whew, that is, uh, that is it. I will turn it back to Aaron for extra credit and any questions with the remaining time. Well, thank you, thank you so much, Scott. And, and for the folks on the line, I know that was a lot of information, a lot of great information, Scott. And just a reminder that, you know, you've got the PDF to, to work through. Uh, if for some reason you can't find the slides or have trouble accessing them, just let us know. We'll get them to you. And this presentation will be uh, available free and on demand on our website uh, shortly. So if you feel like you need to go back or you want to walk through something again, you can do that. Um, speaking of what's on our website, uh, just a reminder, we have two or three things. We, we try to be uh, good citizens in the higher ed community. We have our blog. Uh, and there's a picture of Scott in the lower left-hand corner there. He's a frequent contributor 
Um, we have uh, these webinars that we do. And actually, if you go to our TCLA website, um, it's not just higher ed webinars. We, we have other practices in the firm that do webinars as well. Here you see the summer camp webinar, but uh, both before and after that, we've had um, other webinars and other topics. I'll just highlight in the lower right-hand corner, we had one on the new vaccine mandates. Um, just a little earlier this month. So for example, labor and employment are frequently doing uh, updates as well. Uh, and again, those are all free and available on demand. In addition, we occasionally will do um, sort of freestanding training series and projects. Scott and I actually did a training series, six parts on Title IX and uh, sexual managing sexual misconduct on campus after the new Title IX rule came out last summer. And that again, free and on YouTube. That's about seven hours of training with video. Uh, and would be delighted for you to check that out. And, um, and also keep an eye out, we frequently will just create compliance materials for folks that we think are helpful. So just by way of example, we had a Title IX compliance checklist. Uh, we have a financial responsibility reporting guide for the folks and in institutions that have oversight of that obligation and other similar white papers and documents that we will frequently put out. So if you're on our mailing list, you ought to get um, all or most of those, uh, but again, they're for you, the higher ed community, uh, and they are free and they are intended to just help make your daily life a little bit easier. So we've got about five minutes here uh, at the end. By the way, we do have our standard disclaimer. I'll just let the last screen sit there, which essentially just says, by the way, we're not your attorney. Um, a couple of questions for you, Scott. I mean, the first is, and you talked a little bit, you made a reference towards Title IX at the end, and we have a question here, you know, does Ti and then we were just talking about the training series. Does Title IX apply to uh, summer camp activities? Uh, it, it could, right. So, it, I mean, to the extent, I mean, it, it, for those familiar with Title IX, there are a number of, of jurisdictional definitional requirements um, but to the extent that it uh, that it, it fits, it absolutely uh, could apply. Um, and you, uh, especially depending on the the nature of the the individual that's participating in the camp, if they're a student or faculty member or thing like that. So um, important to to kind of keep that in mind if if Title IX does apply. Uh, and and if it doesn't, just make also thinking through: Are there other university uh, policies, procedures that 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 might apply if if title if it's not a Title IX incident, there could be other things that uh, that kind of that allow or require the institution to kind of take action uh, with regard to a specific incident. Um, very good. Uh, another question: Can you discuss a little more about releases of liability, releases of image, uh, and things of that nature? So I guess the question would be, you know, I would assume, yeah, everyone for every kind of summer camp, you would want a release of liability and typically image release, although maybe you don't want to be, you know, uh, too aggressive with, with using images of minors. I, I don't know. Uh, what do you think about that, Scott? Uh, I think you're, you're, you're right. So I, I, there's no harm in and asking for it, um, and, and I think there's prudential considerations, right, <clears throat> to the extent you want to put that information kind of publicly available on, on websites and things like that or advertisements. Um, but, but certainly good to have uh, permission to start with. Um, and, and forms are, are, are part of the, the, the process. Um, a lot of the comments and concerns that, that we I received about kind of when you when you provide these release liability forms as, as you, regards to length, and they're just generally too much. Everything's looking to to shorten things, and to the extent that's a, that's a good practice. But there's just certain things that that need to be required to protect the institution. Um, and so I think the a, a liability form, a waiver that includes the assumption of risk, the hold harmless, the identification. Uh, is important the medical consent language, uh, the health information form, camp rules. Um, those are all pretty lengthy documents, but but important to to make sure that you're able to successfully protect the institution and continue holding the camp, uh, uh, and then kind of rely on that if there is a, a potential issue moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, I will just as, a, as anecdotally, I had a client years ago that um, 
you know, with all the cooking show crazes and whatnot, had decided that they were going to offer a, a summer camp that involved uh, teaching kids uh, culinary skills. Um, and it was open to middle schoolers and teenagers. And they said, do you think we need a release? And I said, well, are they going to be using knives? And they said, well, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a cooking, you know, program camp. And I said, yes, I think you definitely need a release. <laughs> and it was sort of an afterthought, which I thought was, I thought was remarkable, but that's the difference between normal people and lawyers. Um, I think we have time for one more question. It is 3.30, but, but I want to make sure to get this one in. It's a, it's an interesting one. Um, does HIPAA cover health information obtained for campers? Great complicated question. question. Um, yeah, complicated question. Right, and the lawyerly answer is is right. It it, it depends, but for the most part, uh, institutions that that kind of don't have medical centers are not would not be covered by HIPAA. They'd be covered uh, by FERPA for student records. And to the extent that you're not engaging in a HIPAA covered activity, which is kind of the the health um, information. Uh, processing and, and, and data, uh, then then HIPAA would not apply. But again, and I think it there's often depends on yeah the yeah that's institution circumstances. Yeah, and that's complicated because I, I in fact I think a lot of institutions sometimes think that HIPAA covers their student records when in some cases it does not actually. It really depends on what the institution does and the kind of activities it engages in on campus. I think a lot of vendors these days that work with schools including some that may work with summer camps, just sort of assume that HIPAA covers everything. And, you know, you may need to be thoughtful. That having been said, Scott, I assume the advice still would be, you know, anytime you're obtaining health or medical information or any private information, you should certainly maintain it in confidence and treat it as confidential information. Fair, fair enough? Very fair, yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any last thoughts, uh, Mr. Goldschmidt? No, I mean, I, I, I do not, the idea was not to scare people away. Uh, I, I am a big proponent of, of, of summer camps and the product of a lot of university summer camps myself. And uh, hopefully the idea is to give some, some food for thought as you're, you're considering uh, running your worthwhile camps and, and avoid liability issues and really just focus on all the, the great benefits it has to, to students and, uh, and minors moving forward. Yeah. Great programs, just good thoughts, and good and doing it the right way is important. Hey, uh, well, thank you, Scott, as always. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. Um, by the way, we plan to do another webinar next month. Uh, I'll be doing an end-of-the-year regulatory roundup where we talk about what's going on in Washington, D.C. Uh, with the U.S. Department of Education and all these regulatory rulemakings and other type things. Hope you'll tune in for that. Uh, until next time, be well, be safe, uh, and we'll see you soon. Bye.